So I'm going to go ahead and just get us started with today's program. So again, I just want to welcome everyone. Thank you for being here this morning for this conversation. Uh, my name is uh, Janice Tondora, and I am the co-director of the New England MHTTC, which stands for the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. That's a, that's a mouthful. Um, that is a SAMHSA-funded uh, nationwide initiative, and at the Yale Program for Recovery and Community Health, we have had the pleasure for the last six years um, to lead the New England Region 1 MHTTC, and our particular area of focus and mission in Region 1 is around the promotion of recovery-oriented, equity-focused care. So today's webinar fits squarely with that mission. I think we're in for a really powerful presentation. I honestly can think of no better way uh, than to end Pride Month with today's webinar. And I'm especially thankful um, to Tony and Melissa and to Dr. Christie for being here and joining us and being willing to really share their collective and very, very deep um, both professional and lived experience around our topic today. A triple P perspective, personal, parental, and professional perspectives on promoting inclusivity and positive mental health for LGBTQ youth. So before I can go any further, I have to start with some um, housekeeping items and just our standard acknowledgements and disclaimers. So just the reminder that today's presentation was prepared under um, a cooperative agreement with the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration through the uh, Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. We believe today's webinar to be very much aligned with SAMHSA's mission and values. However, any of the expressed opinions of uh, facilitators today or um, any participants in the webinar are not intended to reflect official uh, position of the Department of Health and Human Services. And then I would just say that um, across the MHTTC network, we really strive in all of our presentations and conversations to use affirming and respectful recovery-oriented um, language. And just a few of the examples of the values around that are being inclusive and accepting of all diverse cultures, making sure that we're non-judgmental and avoiding assumptions, making sure we're consciously um, using respectful language, um, both written and verbally. And we really strive to live out these principles, not just in our language, but also in our thinking and our behavior and treatment of others. Um, and that includes maintaining those expectations within our webinars. And um, in my experience, I think we've done a really nice job with our Region 1 stakeholders living up to those expectations. And I just want to remind everyone that we expect that we will continue to do so today and just be mindful of our language um, and our treatment of others when we're adding to the conversation. Then last couple of things, just from a housekeeping perspective, we have never had to close down a webinar in the past to my knowledge, but we do have the ability to do that for security um, issues if needed. We are going to have the opportunity, I'm trying to save a little bit of time at the end of the webinar for um, questions for our facilitators. Um, please, if you have questions along the way, put them into the chat box. And I would ask if you could direct them specifically to me, that's going to help us to track them on our end so that we don't sort of lose track of them. Make sure we either get to them at the concluding Q&A, or I might interject and ask one of our facilitators to say a little bit more about that before we move on. So we are recording today's session. You all should have gotten a pop-up to consent to that. If you have tech issues, please let us know in the chat. We'll do our best to help you out. In general, we really encourage active use of the chat. Um, let us know if you like what you're hearing, if it resonates with your experience. And then at the end of the webinar, there will be a, a QR code where you can give us some feedback on today's event. Um, so that's really all from a housekeeping perspective. But finally, I just, I just wanna say that I'm especially pleased to help 
um, support today's event and this conversation, not just as a professional who's really committed to creating inclusive and safe and healing spaces, you know, for all people, but also as a parent myself, um, as a mom of a non-binary young adult who is on their own gender journey, I've really seen firsthand the destructive impact of exclusion and marginalization, but I've also seen the really beautiful healing power of the kinds of things that you're gonna hear about today from our presenters in terms of making sure that all people really feel seen, heard, and loved. Um, and I'm just really looking forward to the conversation and so thankful um, that they agreed to join us. So I'm actually gonna turn it over now to our director of our school mental health initiative, Dr. Martha Staley, who's just gonna set the stage about how this fits with our school mental health initiative. So Martha, you can take it away. Thank you very much, Janice. Hi, everyone. I'm Martha Staley. I'm the director of the School Mental Health Initiative. Um, and I am so pleased to be here today and to be able to participate in this really wonderful, really important panel discussion. And as we said in the summary for this, three perspectives and one unifying vision. And over the course of the last six years in the School Mental Health Initiative of MHTTC, our goal, our aim has been to help create resources, training, consultation, and discussion around how we can create schools that are affirming, equitable, compassionate places for students, for families, and for staff. And I think that this really beautifully ties together those themes and the themes that Janice talked about in terms of ensuring that our youth are seen, heard, and loved, ensuring that we have places where all people feel safe, where they feel affirmed and seen, where they're respected, where they know that there are adults who will support them and care for them and advocate for them and help them. So um, with no further ado, I wanna pass it over to Tony to bring us into the session. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday, right? <laughs> so yeah, my name is Tony Ferriolo. Um, I'm really pleased and honored to be here today. I've been um, training and speaking on trans and non-binary youth since 2006. Um, after my own transition in 2005, um, I realized that trans and non-binary children had no one, nowhere to go, no one to talk to. And I thought it was super important that they had a space. You know, a lot of people ask me a lot, like, how much did your life change after you transitioned? And I can tell you this from my heart that prior to transition, my nightly decision was, did I want to live the next day? You know, suicidal ideation, self-harm was a daily thing for me. And then after I transitioned, I can't wait until tomorrow. Every person deserves to feel that way. Every child deserves to feel that way. So my part of this um, presentation today is to really go over some you know, common terms and like explaining gender. Uh, but I also first want to start with a, a family that we worked with probably, started working with probably like two, three years ago. Um, and I like to start with a video. This is Oakley's story. I, I knew that I was trans and I wanted to be a boy, but I didn't want to be trans because like the discrimination and how like, I don't wanna say how difficult life would be being trans, but like it would just be harder. And I just wanted just to be just your quote unquote normal. Who we wanted to be was not who we thought, not who we was assigned at birth. And, um, not who we had named him, and um, everything that we thought we knew about Oakley was wrong. And it was so hard for him to tell us. It was so hard for him to come out to us with, with how we truly felt, because I think he was afraid of how we would react, of um, failing us, of disappointing us, of all the things that any child would feel. When I was born, obviously I was assigned female at birth. Once puberty hit 
and obviously my body started changing is probably when I started noticing like a level of uncomfortability. He told me how he wasn't eating at all and that he was limiting his caloric intake and that he hated how he looked and he hated how his body was. I thought that what I was feeling was just focused on my weight for whatever reason. As the year went on, I just started feeling less and less like myself and but I didn't know who myself like who I was supposed to be like I didn't feel like myself but I didn't know who myself was. We called the doctor we got um, him into uh, a, a program that was uh, an IOP program so he was there five days a week for a few hours every day. I still had this like self-hatred and I was like I don't know what this is from. The self-harm got to such a bad place, we ended up having to take him to the hospital, and he was in the hospital for a week. I didn't want to die, I just didn't want to live how I was living. And I was realizing that nothing I was doing, nothing we were doing was working, and Oakley could not see himself in this world. I had to realize that I needed to do something right now. So I promised him that when we left, I would um, make the phone call, I would get him into a gender clinic, and I would start making him whole. I reached out to Healthcare Advocates International when Oakley was about 14. I just didn't want to continue if this is what life was going to be like, being like closeted and stuff. It's just so much more difficult. That phone call that he had was FaceTiming from a gurney in the ER, and I swear it it changed him like that. And there was definitely this like, went from sort of being completely hopeless of, I cannot see what tomorrow's gonna look like to, oh my God, I'm kind of hopeful because now I can see a future because he tells me I can see a future because Tony says, I, I know what you need and I know how you feel and I've been there and there was nobody that said that to him before. I, sw I couldn't believe the, the change because when, Oakley got off the phone, it was like, he was like, oh my God, like a deep breath of my God, somebody understands me and somebody's listening to me and somebody says it's okay. And somebody says it's okay that I can be who I know I am and who I want to be and who I need to be. I no longer worry about him being up in his room um, doing self-harm. I no longer worry about whether um, well, we're, we're gonna find him, you know, in a, in a bad place. Um, no longer have to put meds away and knives away and worry when we leave, leaving him alone. And I just don't have to worry about that right now. What I need to do right now is um, everything that I can do to help him be who he's supposed to be. So where is Oakley today? Since that phone call, and every time I get very emotional, um, I remember the pain this poor child was in when, when he got on that FaceTime um, call with me from the ER. So where is he today? He's smiling every day. He has friends. He's, he's going to school. He's thriving. And the only reason why he's thriving is because he had one person that said to him, it's okay. And his family allowed him to be who he knows he is. He has not been hospitalized. He has not performed any self-harm. It's, it's, you know, for those of us who've been doing this for years, it's a no brainer to allow a human to, to walk the path that they know they need to walk. And as adults in their lives, I, I strongly feel that it's our responsibility to guide them through life and make sure that they're happy and loved and, and they feel like they belong because the most dangerous emotional roadblock for LGBTQ kids is when they're loved and accepted before they come out and they're not loved and accepted afterwards. You know, so sometimes they need somebody outside their family who's that one person because a Trevor Project survey showed in 2018 that one person, one affirming adult in an LGBTQ kid's life will cut the chance of suicide by 40%. 40%, that's a big number. So as promised, we're going to talk about gender. So this is a genderbred person. I'm not sure how many of you have seen this image. Um, this is a really cool way to help people understand the differences between gender identity, gender expression, and a bunch of other things. 
If you take anything away from the slide, please take away from the slide that nothing is connected. I'll give you some examples along the way. And I love animation as you're gonna find out. Okay, here we go. Gender identity. Gender identity lives in your brain. It is your sense of being male, female, something else, both or neither. Something else, both or neither. We'll talk about that in a little while. It is totally separate from your gender expression. Your gender expression is how do you show up in the world through, you know, through clothing, mannerisms, haircuts, your external expression is separate from your gender identity. You know, a lot of times I'm asked by a parent if they have a young trans girl who, you know, was born with the presumed sex of um, male and has transitioned to female. Well, how could they be female? They're not wearing, they don't want to wear dresses. That is totally separate from your gender identity. You can have people who aren't trans, say women who are not trans, cisgender women, who feel more comfortable in a baseball hat, t-shirt, and jeans, right? It's not, they don't feel like men, but they're presenting a little more masculine, all right? Totally separate from your, from anatomical sex, hormones, chromosomes, genitalia. Yeah, we're going to talk about genitalia for a second. I think the best way to describe, when I describe to kids about gender, and sometimes their parents, um, I'll say something like this, you know, when you're born, somebody looks at your body and they guess what your gender identity is going to be. And then when that baby gets old enough, they tell the adults if they guessed right or not. That That's the truth. There's no magic string that connects genitalia to your brain. I think the best example I can give you is if you are a cisgender man um, and just say you had cancer or in a car accident and they had to remove your penis, it happens, everyone. Would you wake up from that procedure um, feeling like a woman? No. Would you wake up from that procedure feeling like you don't have any gender identity? No, you would wake up from that procedure still feeling male, period. So that's why we can't say because you don't have that, you're not that. We can't say that. Sexual attraction versus romantic attraction, two different things. Uh, you know, some people aren't sexually attracted to anyone. They, they identify usually as asexual, but they can definitely be in a romantic relationship with someone. You also have someone who might be sexually attracted to more than one gender, but only sees, sees themselves in a relationship with one or the other. What's super cool about this slide is that every single person in the world, including all of us today, is a variation of every single thing. Now, if you want to come into my personal bubble, and my personal bubble is a fun place to be, you can ask a couple of panelists because they kind of hang out with me sometimes. Um, this stuff doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that you're a kind person. What matters to me is that you're empathetic and you have compassion for humans. This stuff doesn't even come into place. Transgender, I wanna go over a couple of terms and then give you some misconceptions. A transgender person is someone who has a different sex, gender identity and or gender expression than the one assigned to them at birth, regardless of their sexual orientation. Fun fact about me, I used to be a lesbian, okay? Before I transitioned, I was attracted to females, after I transitioned, I'm still attracted to females. Sexual orientation has nothing to do with gender identity, all right? Some misconceptions. Transgender people struggle with mental illness. Okay, sure, some of us do, just like some people in every community does. And I was at a conference quite a few years ago, and this trans woman was a keynote speaker, and she said this, being trans doesn't mean you're crazy, but being trans can make you crazy. Now, one of the hardest parts of my work that I have been doing for almost 20 years now is sitting in psych units with children who don't want to live anymore, you know, and they're not there for any other reason. They're not there because they're trans. They're there because nobody believes that they're trans, right? It's not, it's not internal influences that are causing them all this pain. It's external influences that are causing them pain. But another misconception is that surgery is top priority for all transgender people. Well, your gender identity lives in your brain. And for some transgender people, medical intervention is not needed for them to feel happy and whole. But for those of us who need surgery, it is absolutely medically necessary. Transgender children are too young to know that they are transgender. I'll tell you, I think if I had a dime for every time I've heard that since I started the work, I would have bought Twitter and I wouldn't have backed out the first time. You see what I'm saying? I would be a very, very wealthy person. 
again, we know what happens to children when we deny them their existence. Those are the kids that I'm visiting. Those are the kids that are self-harming. Those are the kids that are thrown away. Those are the kids that don't feel like they belong anywhere. We need to believe children and just guide them and say, okay, what do you need? What do you need? That A lot of people say, well, how do you work? I mean, my God, you're like, I'm not a kid whisperer. Some of you compare me to Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer. I am not that, okay? What I am is somebody who believes children when they tell me what they need. I don't care if you're five or 95, if you're suffering, you know what you need to feel better, right? And that's the only thing I ask them when I'm sitting in front of them and they're telling me they don't want to live anymore and they start crying. I, I never say to them, don't cry, it's going to be okay, ever. I allow them to have that emotion. And then I'll say something like, I'm sorry you're suffering. I'm here for you. What do you need? And when they tell me what they need, I believe them. That is so important. Non-binary. Okay, put your seatbelts on. Here we go. Non-binary gender is any gender that isn't exclusively male or female. Non-binary people may feel some mix of both male and female, so somewhere in between or something completely different. Mind blow. I'm binary. Okay. I will never know what it feels like to be a non-binary person, but I don't deny them of their existence. Okay. And a lot of people who are binary do that. I can't imagine what it's like to not feel like male or female. What are they talking about? That can't be, it can't happen because I can't even think about what that feels like. Well, I will never know what it feels like to be born in a body that matches my gender identity, but I still believe that cisgender people exist, even though trans people are much cooler. Sorry, it had to be said. All right. I'm glad this is being recorded. Okay. All right. Some misconceptions. They don't exist. Again, that's coming from people who can't, who's trying to figure out what that feels like. You never will. Do not set yourself up for failure, please. Non-binary people are just confused. Non-binary people do not medically transition. That's a big misconception. If anyone needs medical transition, give it to them to make them feel happy and whole. All, all non-binary people go by they, them pronouns. Absolutely false. You know, I get a lot of pushback when I'm training because people say to me, well, you know, you know, they, them, that's for more than one person. You know, that doesn't make sense. You've been using they and them for one person your entire life. Christy and I like to go to Miso restaurant in, in New Haven, right? Cool. So we're in the restaurant, we're leaving the restaurant and Christy sees somebody in front of us that drops their wallet. She looks at me and says, oh my God, they just dropped their wallet. One person, you've been using they, them for one person all the time. All right, now I want to go over a couple of things. I, I published two books. The third one is going to come out probably next year after my memoir is coming out in the fall. But when I started doing the work with trans and non-binary kids, they would come into the groups crying about the way they were treated by doctors, by teachers, by their parents. So I decided that I would have them draw as an artist myself, um, art got me away from self-harm, that I would ask them questions and they would draw the answers. So I just got a couple of examples because of time restraints. So the first, the first book, first, first question was, what does body dysphoria feel like? Okay, but let me explain to you what that is just in case you don't know. Body dysphoria is a term used to describe the distress, unhappiness, and anxiety that transgender and non-binary people may feel about the mismatch between their bodies and their gender identity. Body dysphoria is not just about our bodies, it's also about our voices and our height, okay? People have to just remember that, be very sensitive to that um, when you're seeing somebody who's trans or non-binary. These drawings are graphic, but it's reality. Okay, here we go. I got one for this one. This is Edgar, age 14. Body dysphoria to me feels like being locked in a cage, as cliche as that may sound. Sometimes I feel superior, but my human form is keeping me down. There are lots of things I'll never be able to experience because of my body. Even worse, many people think my human form has to define me. I drew weapons around my cage because I feel like I'm being tortured for having any confidence, and my body is my punishment. I never thought that Edgar would draw a drawing like this. Again, he would come into group not 
not sad. He would come into group smiling. And when I got this drawing, I was like, holy, like never thought that he was in that much pain. Now, this is from the third book that's coming out, Sneak Peek, for all of you. Um, the, the first question in that book is, what does it feel like to be misgendered? All right. Luce um, drew this when they were nine. They are non-binary. They go by they, them pronouns. School was not on board. Um, I've been training school since 2006, so I kind of scooted into town and trained them. I heard they're doing better. But this is a nine-year-old, okay, saying this about dysphoria, um, you know, um, being misgendered at school. I feel uncomfortable. It makes my stomach hurt. I don't feel good. I'm scared and worried. Scared and worried. The only thing they should be worried about is if they did their homework or their mother cut the crust off of their peanut butter and jelly sandwich, okay? Not somebody addressing them with the pronoun that they use. I want you to think about this. How can we expect a student to give 100% to their studies if they cannot be 100% of who they are. It's impossible. We're setting them up for failure. They don't feel like they belong in the space. The best way to have somebody feel like they belong in a space is through kindness. And the best way to be kind to somebody is when you honor who they are. Name, pronoun. Okay. Now, this next one is really graphic. And Arthur mentions a binder. A binder is a garment, looks like a tank top. And it compresses a chest, you know, trans, masculine, non-binary people wear them. Um, they're life-saving. They really are. So here's Arthur. This is my dysphoria from being misgendered. It is so painful, so scary. It's hard to express. Words are not strong enough. I drew myself in my binder with loads of scars, big cuts, and crying blood. The knives are making me bleed, bleed out from being misgendered. Arthur is not exaggerating and he's not trying to get anybody's attention this child is in pain and the only thing he needs is for his parents to call him arthur and he you know we have to understand that children don't have much control over their lives at all at all they just don't they don't the only thing young trans and non-binary kids have control over is call me he and and call me tony right and if we can give that to them and they feel like their transition is moving even at a snail's pace. We save them. You know, there's a lot of statistics out there. Trevor Project, wonderful organization, has statistics on, you know, self-harm, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts. But nobody talks about the ones that have succeeded. And we have lost children in Connecticut to suicide, for sure. Okay, what are you actually saying when you ignore somebody's gender pronoun? I only have one example, be again, because of time, but typically I, I have more, but I picked out the best one, okay? Your sense of safety is not important to me. When you misgender someone, you run the risk of threatening their personal sense of safety as well as their physical safety. When someone feels invalidated or disrespected, they may not feel safe or comfortable in the space. My mother's 86. My mother likes going to Target. Who does she call? Me. Always, always. And I take her because she says I'm fun. Okay. But she'll scream my dead name, my birth name, and she'll she me the whole time. So I always have to call her over and say, you know, Ma, listen, they're not going to think I'm trans. They're going to think you're freaking crazy. Okay. But the reality, the reality is if somebody kind of, kind of got like, wait a minute, is that a trans person? We can be hurt, beaten, murdered going out to my car. People kill trans people and non-binary people, you know? So, so be careful what to out somebody who's not out or, you know, this is really, really important. But here we go. Uh, when chosen name and pronoun use mistakes happen, and they will, and the person corrects you, thank them for correcting you and move on. Okay? Don't apologize. Christy, this is what I'm going to ask you to unmute. And Christy and I would do a little role play. I got to stay, stay on script, Christy, because I know I'm really like running kind of close to time. Okay. Um, Christy's name used to be Jack. Uh, now it's Christy. I'm going to say good morning, Jack. And Christy's going to say, my name is Christy. Okay, cool. Ready? All right. Good morning, Jack. My name is Christy. Thank you for correcting me, Christy. Smile and move on. Okay. Smiles are free. Don't cut into anybody's budget. Kindness is free. All right. The difference between saying, thank you for correcting me and moving on versus, oh my God, I'm sorry. Oh my God, that's right. Oh man, I keep doing that. Blah, blah. 
when you do that, you put the other person in the position to try to make you feel better about what you just did. And they're going to say something like, it's okay, and it's not okay. But when I said, thank you for correcting me, Christy, um, and I that that's making her feel affirmed, heard, and empowered. Totally different. You have to remember that somebody's name and pronoun is not about you. And if you shift that energy from, you know, I want to, I, I have to, to I want to, need and want, two different energies, you know, instead of saying, Tony, I've been calling Tony, you know, Mary and she for 10 years. I got to, how am I supposed to do that? That's hard for me. That's hard for me. Again, not about you. Instead of saying, of course, I want to honor that person. I'm going to, I'm going to call them what they want to be called. Okay. Now, thank you, Christy. There's a lot of shame about being misgendered and sometimes people will not correct you. Listen, don't drop off your chairs, but sometimes I'm still misgendered by people who used to know me before I transitioned. And sometimes I'm in the emotional space to correct you and sometimes I'm not, all right? So if you catch yourself using the wrong name and pronoun and the person does not correct you, say, excuse me, correct yourself and move on, all right? I'm gonna just give an example. Christy doesn't need to jump on, but this is what I would do, okay? Good morning, Jack. Excuse me, Christy. Smile, move on, okay? Thank you. That's me. Next up, I think we're transitioning to Christy. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. And Tony, thank you so much. It's so great to to be here with you on a panel and also hard to follow um, you, <laughs> but I'm gonna come with the boring, the boring, some of the boring data um, that I think is really important. And I start, you know, actually before before going there, um, you know, I just wanna talk about, you know, this is Pride Month and I think it's also important for us to talk about um, <clears throat> joy, which I'll get to in a little bit, but, you know, and, and Pride, and we had a youth who actually created this, um, this beautiful picture here for us about um, having folks come together and feeling this pride um, amongst themselves. You can see the different pride flags and different colors of different pride, um, you know, with different abilities and, and different colors of folks. Um, and so I think that, you know, the goal is to help people get to this point where they feel this pride and this comfort in themselves and they feel a sense of community. And we'll talk about the importance of that as well. Um, I am uh, Christy Olszewski. I'm an associate professor at Yale um, in the departments of psychiatry, pediatrics, and the Child Study Center. Um, I am also the director of the Yale Pediatric Gender Program. And Tony, it's our 10-year anniversary. Um, it was 10 years ago um, that we that we were chatting about um, the need for Yale to have a pediatric gender program. And um, so we officially opened in 2015. We're interdisciplinary in nature. We serve folks 3 to 25. Um, we are integrated in our care um, and because we think it's important to treat the whole person. So there's always an endocrinologist and a psychologist at every visit. Um, we also oftentimes have our lawyer involved, which has been really, really helpful. Um, and we have a lot of um, community connections with folks and uh, referral sources for GYN, ReproEndo, um, et cetera. So um, just to go sort of, to segue directly from Tony's talk, um, you know, this is some of the data from the Trevor Project in 22. Um, and so you can see this is for all LGBTQ youth asking folks if they had considered suicide in the past year on the left um, and attempted suicide in the past year. Um, this is a survey of, you know, you can see almost 45,000 um, youth, 13 to 24 across the US. Um, and the numbers here are, are strikingly high. So, you know, you have about, you know, half of folks um, half to 52% will say if this is an average of trans um, kids and non-binary folks considering suicide in the past year, you know, 60% is usually what we've been seeing in our, um, in our own clinic. And attempting suicide in the past year, it's about 20%. So these are really high rates of folks um, who have considered suicide, um, attempted suicide, and these numbers are particularly high. Uh, for our black and brown kids. And so thinking about, you know, multiple intersecting identities is really important when we see folks and understanding, um, you know, how is it that they have been treated? And I'm setting this up a little bit, um, but how have folks been treated in their own environments and how is this impacting how they feel about themselves? 
We also see high rates of anxiety and depression. And unfortunately, you know, as you can see on the, on the left hand um, column, you see, you know, symptoms of anxiety and depression very high and higher in the trans and non-binary community rather than uh, the LGB community. Um, and 60% of youth um, who were surveyed said that they had wanted mental health care in the past year, but were unable to get it. Um, and so that to me was also really um, disappointing and striking and, and worrisome. Um, they also looked at some of the reasons why folks were not getting the care that they needed. And that was, you know, fear of discussion, discussing mental health concerns with a provider, concerns with obtaining parent and caregiver permission. I would also suggest that sometimes in here, you know, you have kids saying, well, if I talk about this, then they're going to think that, um, you know, my depression or whatnot is, is, you know, or my trauma that I have experienced is what's lead, you know, what is my trans identity. And so then they're not going to be able to give me the care that I need. And, um, and that's really unfortunate also, um, because we know that victimization is happening in this community um, at higher rates, and that is what's impacting folks' mental health care. So if we look at um, the gender minority stress model, this is a really nice way to understand why there's such high rates of um, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, self-injurious behaviors. As, as you know, um, in Oakley's story you heard, you know, sometimes there's a, um, a restriction of caloric intake um, by some kids because they want to stop um, their bumps from growing on their chest or they want to stop their menses from happening. Um, and so they want to look more masculine um, or non-binary. And so, you know, you're seeing these increased rates of, um, of eating, of problematic eating behaviors as well. And so if you look at this model, you can see these distal or external factors that are really impacting folks. Um, and, and just to sort of give you the history of the gender minority stress model, you know, this is originally had been looked at in lesbian women um, in the late 80s and then had grown into looking at um, gay men and queer folks in general and then had been expanded to trans and non-binary folks um, by Rai Testa and, and friends um, in, in 2013. Um, and so here you can see these external factors, discrimination, rejection, victimization, and non-affirmation that has this direct relationship um, to negative mental health and physical health outcomes, right? You also have this, these external factors being related to and separate from these more internal factors, what, we, what they call proximal factors. So internalized transphobia, it's not good to be trans, I can't be trans, negative expectations about the future, I'm not gonna be able to get care or people aren't gonna love me. This non-disclosure of gender identity, right? I can't be who I am, I can't tell people. Body dysphoria, I feel uncomfortable and in my body and in certain areas of my body bring me a lot of discomfort. And they also added an identity confusion recently, um, which is I think, you know, not having the space to explore who you are and um, being told that you can only um, identify certain ways. Now there are those also, those internal factors also um, have been related to more increase or an increase of negative mental health and physical health outcomes. It seems as though the resilience factors include community connectedness, so connections to other LGBTQ folks, um, pride in oneself, and family support. So we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, how folks are treated in the community. The U.S. Trans Health Survey is one of the largest surveys um, uh, by trans folks and for trans folks. Um, it started in 2010, 2015 was a lot larger. Um, they broke this down by state, so here's some state data, and they just came out with the 20. Well, it's supposed to come out in 2020, 2020, and we all know what happened. And so, um, the 2022 data just came out. Um, they're starting to look at it, but this is looking at just specifically Connecticut. Um, for those of you who are in Connecticut, you know, in finding that, you know, in 2015, still half of folks, more than half of folks, are avoiding public restrooms. 11% um, of folks reported being verbally harassed in the restroom. Um, there's still reparative therapy going on, saying, you know, you cannot be trans. You have to identify as cis. Um, and, you know, there's a high rates of being uh, fired in employment, um, you know, employment discrimination, housing discrimination. And as you can see here, 29% of folks in 2015 reported having a negative treatment in a medical setting. Um, and so that's being denied care, um, being harassed uh, or assaulted in medical settings because they were trans. And so um, this was really striking, again, um, to me to think that in Connecticut, um, you know, we still had these very high rates 
of discrimination happening in, in medical settings specifically, as well as in public health settings and um, in employment settings. Now, Clifton is a great resource also to look at what's happening in schools. This is a, um, a resource that comes out every two years. So this is their most recent data published uh, in the school climate survey in 2021. And you can see that there were about 22,000 students across the US again that were surveyed and 45% of kids are, are avoiding bathrooms. Um, we see this also in the clinical setting where kids are not you know, eating or drinking and so that they can avoid bathrooms. Bathrooms are either you know, the non-binary bathrooms may be too far away from where they are or they're locked or somebody else is using them for you know, smoking or vaping or something. And so these kids don't feel comfortable going to the bathroom, so they're not. They're also afraid of using the locker rooms um, and avoid PE class. As you can also see on the right, you know, 16.2% of kids reported that they had to change schools because they felt unsafe in those schools. So I think it's really important for us to just be aware of these stats and what's happening. In addition, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> um, there's a lot of anti-trans legislation that's happening. Um, LGBTQ MAP, which is the Movement Advancement Project, is a really great way to keep up to date on this. And as you can see in here, you know, there were 300 bills in 22. Uh, 510, 23, 522 as of 621, 24. Um, I actually just looked because I was like, oh, well, you know, that was like a week ago. Maybe it's more. And no, actually, um, there are three more, uh, three or four more that have been added um, in the last week. And so this is constantly changing and increasing. You know, this map shows you what are high um, policy tallies that are supportive of LGBTQ folks in the green and where there's negative policies in the red. Um, and we know here, you know, this includes, um, you know, bans on hormonal therapy, sports bans, bathroom bans, et cetera. Now we are in, you know, the Northeast where there's more green overall pol policy tallies. However, what we know is that kids are still intaking media, right? They're still on TikTok or Instagram and they're seeing headlines come through um, and so there are all these headlines that I pulled um, actually a little while back, you know, but kids are seeing this and they're worried. They're worried about their friends. They're worried about their partners. They are also seeing increased violence. You know, we're also having a lot of, you know, cis kids who are hearing about this potentially from their um, families. And there's an increase that we're seeing in violence and harassment, even in states where there are not. Um, negative, uh, or I should say healthcare bans or um, bathroom bans. So that is leading to this increased anxiety, depression, and distress that we're seeing um, from folks, even if they're in quote unquote more green or safer states, right? So if we go back to this gender minority stress model, we can see these external factors that are really impacting folks' mental health and how those external factors are also impacting those internal proximal factors. Right? And if there's not community connectedness, if there's not pride, if there's not family support, we can definitely see how that's impacting folks' mental health, right? So what is our role? Our role is not to just look at the individual, but also to be thinking about the environmental stressors. For our prepubescent kids, this is what we're doing is we're supporting them, right? With any sort of transition, we're understanding how they can be safe, how they can explore their identity. What is it that they like to do? How do they like to, you know, dress, what do they like to do in terms of roles or play, right? Being more flexible in the way that we're um, helping them to explore themselves. Christina Olson is an amazing researcher out of Princeton, and she started to look at, you know, kids, young kids who are supported in their identities, um, you know, how are they doing in relationship to their peers, their age match peers, and their siblings? And it seems as though kids who are supported in their identities have the same levels of depression as their siblings and age match peers, subclinical, and just slightly higher, but still subclinical levels of anxiety than their age match peers and their siblings. So it seems as though kids, young kids who are really supported seem to be doing okay. Now we have to be thinking about what are the socialization agents? How are kids learning about, you know, um, what, what they should play with, who they could be when they grow up, how, what do they wear. Um, and we have to be thinking about, you know, how we're reacting to kids that may 
be more gender expansive than other folks? And how, what's our reaction and what's the reaction at school? I can tell you, I have a seven-year-old um, who identifies as a, as a boy. Um, he was assigned male at birth, um, but he likes to wear nail polish. And um, when he was younger, we used to do different patterns and different colors. And, um, and then he went to school. And, you know, this was our thing. Every week we would do this, different colors, different patterns, his, you know, grandparents all got into the game and it was like what was he doing and how was he you know expressing himself in these different things he went to school and all of a sudden he came back one day and he was like you know what mama I don't want to do this anymore and I was like hmm, okay what's going on and it was only a couple weeks later that he said that you know somebody at school Evelyn had said like oh no you know only girls can wear nail polish and that is really you know that we have to be thinking about how do we help kids to understand there's no rule about who can wear nail polish right or what you wear because this is gonna be helpful for every kid, right? So how are we thinking about play, dress, books? What are we reading to kids? How can kids be themselves? How can they feel loved? Tony said, you know, there's one person. So if there's one person in our lives, how can we show them that we love them and we support them no matter how they like to dress, act, identify, et cetera, right? So being watchful of our actions, making sure that they can be safe. In our practice, right, using non-gendered language. So students, learners, friends, right, are there ways to sort of group folks other than assigned sex at birth, right? Watching out for assumptions, supporting everybody, right? So how can we do this in our general work? And how can we, if we have children or work within school districts or whatnot, how can we help other folks understand how to be more inclusive of everyone? With puberty, as Tony mentioned, you know, this is where you might see an increase in gender dysphoria. This is when people say, oh, you know what? I wish, I, I thought I could I check a box and decide who I was going to be when I grew up. Or I thought I could pray it away. Or I thought that I, you know, could decide and, and I could eat a certain thing and then that would help me get here. You know, <laughs> there are so many different things that, you know, people may think. And when puberty happens, it's really disruptive. And so this is when you may see an increase in a lot of distress when people say, oh my gosh, there are these bumps here that shouldn't be here, or, you know, I shouldn't have this low voice and facial hair. And it's also important, you know, I know we have a parental um, perspective coming up next that, you know, sometimes parents feel a sense of grief. You know, they have this idea of who their kid was going to be or they, who they thought that their kid was going to be. And so it's also important for us to attend to those, you know, that sense of grief that folks may have. You know, they may be fearful. It is dangerous. It can be dangerous. And so how do we help kids, you know, how do we help parents to um, help their kids feel more safe, right? They have their own coming out. They may have to tell people. And there may be complications. We have plenty of um, folks who maybe there's, you know, one parent that's a little bit more supportive or there's cultural beliefs that make it more difficult. And so how do we help families through this process? Now, we know the Family Acceptance Project, this is a great um, free resource for folks talks about how family support is so important for um, helping to decrease the risk of suicide, um, to depression, self-injurious behavior, substance use, HIV, et cetera. And so I love the Family Acceptance Project. There are really great free resources that can be downloaded um, in offices, et cetera. Um, the, this is one um, poster that they have that talks about behaviors that help Right, bring your kid, your LGBTQ kid to LGBTQ groups and events. Right, talking with religious leaders to help your congregation become supportive of LGBTQ people. Volunteering with organizations to support LGBTQ people. Equally important, they have a poster that talks about behaviors that hurt. Right, not talking about your kid's identity, not using their name and pronouns, telling your kid that God is going to punish them, punish them. You know, making your child leave home because they're LGBTQ plus. So it's really important for folks to understand what can be helpful as well as what can be hurtful. And we also know that with families, you know, there's research on this that chosen name is, is linked to reduce depressive symptoms and suicidal ideation. So I oftentimes will tell people, you know, yes, this may be different, but you know, this is gonna be a free intervention for you to use in the home to see how your kid does. I mean, this, this is related to less depression and less suicidal ideation. So what? Let's try it. And also, you know, parents are oftentimes will ask like, oh, well, my kid is changing their name like five or 10 times and this means it's not real. And it's like, well, this is 
the terms they have to choose their own name. And, you know, you had a name that you were given and you just sort of went with it. And so, you know, it's really important for kids to feel like they can explore different names so that they can find what feels authentic for them. All right. So thinking about do parents need support and validation, psychoeducation, connections to support. When we first started our program in 2015, um, I had a parent who came to me and was like, Christy, this is great. I'm glad that my kid has care, but I need to talk to other parents. So we started a parent support group. And then they were like, well, this is great, but what am I going to do with my kid? So we started kid support group. And I think it's really important to have those connections to community. As we can see, you know, that's a resiliency um, factor, right? So do they need counseling to help with relational issues? Are there economic supports? Tony, uh, you know, um, Tony has had this amazing binder program to provide free binders to folks. I mean, it is amazing to be able to do that for folks that can't afford them. So also, and I know we'll talk a little bit about families and schools, is families may not be aware of their rights in school. They may not be aware of the laws in school. It's been really helpful to have a lawyer on staff um, for the center, from the Center for Children's Advocacy to talk to schools and remind them about the laws. Um, and so I think that that's really important to have a medical legal partnership. And we know that school-based interventions work, you know, as we talked about network expectations in school, mental health initiatives that are, that, you know, and folks that are here today, you know, knowing that school-based supports can be really important and supportive for folks. So having a GSA, having supportive educators, having an anti-bullying policy and following through with it, you know, having this LGBTQ curriculum, having lavender proms, uh, lavender graduation or pink prom, and also bring this to the middle school because, you know, it's important we have this in high school, but also middle school. And I would also, I would argue that elementary school, you know, having inclusive curriculum is important. We know that if there are important, if there are inclusive curriculums, kids stay in school. You know, they are able to graduate um, and they feel like they're more supported. So here's um, a picture of one of Tony's books here, but you know, what are the community groups? Who is in your community? What are the school-based um, connections that you have? And what are the medical programs? It's also important to ask about joy. As I mentioned, you know, this is also from the, the Trevor Project. Um, you know, kids will talk, I think previously we've been looking at folks from a medical model, right? A disease model. Um, and I think that if we move to a more resilience model, this will be much more helpful for folks to be thinking about what brings them pride and joy and how do we also, you know, help them to increase that feeling of pride and joy. There's been a little bit of research that's been coming out on this to help quantify what, what that means. Um, but I think that from kids, it seems like it's pretty expansive and important to talk about. So thinking about your environment, right? How do we have gender neutral bathrooms, magazines, symbols, brochures? What are the things that people are going to see when they come into your environment that's going to signal to them, okay, there's somebody here that gets me, right? Also with our service-based settings, do we have intake forms that are inclusive? Are we watching our terms like handsome and pretty? Are we asking, you know, is there another name that this may be under? What words do you prefer, right? And training everybody, super important. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to our parent perspective. Thank you, Dr. Luzeski. Hi, I'm Melissa Combs. Um, I am a parent of a transgender child, and I am going to talk today a little bit about what the parent's journey looks like. So <clears throat> this is an overview of our story. Uh, my child uh, started really uh, letting us know about their gender journey back in fifth or sixth grade, you know, four to three to four years ago, um, and eventually, came, you know, first came out as as non-binary and asked us to use some chosen names and pronouns. And over the course of of this gender journey, I you know to reiterate something that that. Dr. O spoke about is, you know, we've gone through a number of iterations of names and, and pronouns. Uh, so that is, that is not unusual at all for a child to do that while they're, you know, while they're figuring out who they are. Um, when we got to middle school, <clears throat> uh, that's when it, things just really started to fall apart. 
um, for my for my child. Um, and middle school in my town is seventh and eighth grade, so fortunately sixth was not involved. But it was it was two years of a relentless bullying and harassment. And I think one of the major misconceptions out there is when parents talk about or caregivers talk about their child being bullied and harassed, they just assume it's from peers. The adults in the building do it too. And people need to to remember that um, when working with a child on a gender journey that uh, a lot of the feelings of, of insecurity at school, not feeling safe in school, are actually coming from the adults as well. So um, the first year of the two-year span, I did a lot to try to work with the district. There was a whole network of, of GSA parents that we worked together. And effectively, we were told that... Um, the district would would not demonstrate support for LGBTQ plus students, faculty, and staff because um, there were concerns about about leadership being fired and run out of town, and you know reelection opportunities, um, which was not. I realized at that point that there was nowhere to go with this, and so I partnered with two other families. And um, we filed a complaint with the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, and that process is still ongoing. They did, they did elect to investigate, and we uh, chose to be very visible about this struggle and and spoke with the media, um, which is really putting yourself out there, you know, considering societal attitudes. But even then. Um, you know, parents should have parents shouldn't have to go through these extraordinary measures, right? To to their child should be getting the education they have the right to, no matter no matter their status in a protected class. Um, so I major regret I have is I naively thought that with a federal investigation um, into our local school district that they would behave, and we sent our youngest back to the same school. And that was, again, one of my biggest regrets, really naive of me, because that eighth grade year was equally horrific. And, you know, when I speak about, about adults in schools are also bullies, you know, there were, there were things like um, one, of, one of his teachers excluded him from participation in class because she didn't agree with his gender identity and expression. Um, and administrators would would not appropriately investigate reports of harassment and discrimination. So there were things like that. So also during this time, especially during the seventh grade year, um, there were all the things that that you've you heard Dr. Lazeski talk about, you know, self harm, fear based absences, things like that, and so. It was in about December of 2021 that I started looking for a therapist for my child um, because we have, there was cutting. We found out there was cutting happening and things like that. And it took three months to find a therapist at that point. It was extraordinarily difficult. And um, it seems like nowadays it's much easier um, to find a therapist. People are, are pretty much finding folks very quickly now, but back then with the pandemic and, and the effect that had on children. Um, and I think that there are simply, I mean, not, in the, not as many providers for youth at that time. So it took three months to find a therapist. And I was to the point that I was starting to look in Boston and New York, which I'm sort of equidistant between the two. Um, so then, um, you know, after our child came out as, as uh, trans, uh, we started looking into exploring gender affirming care. And that wait list was like, it was 15 months long. It took 15 months from the time of scheduling the appointment to actually seeing a doctor. And this is one of the places where parents and caregivers can feel really isolated and alone because this is life-saving medical treatment for your child that you cannot access for over a year. And 
uh, couple this with everything that was happening with the schools, you know, we spent an enormous amount of time simply focused on trying to keep our child alive. That's how bad it was. And um, so I, I would say that that is one area that 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 can be looked at as sort of those gaps in time um, where where you're trying to access access services. Ultimately, we had to withdraw our child from our local district, and we <clears throat> we um, are very fortunate where I am that the we have something called regional school choice here. So uh, there are a variety of magnet school options. Um, and we found one that uh, is, is amazing. We went, this was last year, uh, ninth grade, we went an entire year without a single incident. And I would say the biggest, the biggest thing about that year is that my kid got to be a kid for a year because for two years of his life, his childhood was stolen from him. And he just got to be a kid for a year and he is thriving. The school environment is amazing. And, you know, his, you know, his aspirations for higher education have returned. He, um, um, he just, he has ambition. There's so many things that, that, I think underscore the power of, of an affirming learning environment. Now, throughout all of this, uh, the, I was also doing an enormous amount of researching and networking, like how do I, how do I get my child the education that he has the, he legally has the right to? And as a part of that work and, and expanding my network and meeting people like Tony and Dr. Olazewski, um, I realized there was a real gap in services for parents and caregivers. In other words, there was no one-stop shop for people like me who were trying to figure out how to get my child that education. And so in February of 2020, or I'm sorry, March of 2023, I started working with a group of people uh, in the LGBTQ plus community to start shaping the idea for what eventually has now become the Out Accountability Project, which I will talk about in, in, a, in a moment. So moving on to, again, addressing what parents and caregivers are going through when they have a child on, on a gender journey like this. You know, our, our situation, I don't, I don't think it was as, as, as awful as it is for some people, because first of all, my spouse and I were both on the same page, um, uh, very much on the same page. We even specifically, the birth names of our children were gender neutral on purpose. Um, and our household in general was, was very gender neutral and explicitly supportive of the LGBTQ LGBTQ plus community. Um, my kids have been to more queer weddings than, than cishet weddings. So LGBTQ, the LGBTQ plus community was, was, it was a normal, it was a very normal thing for them. Um, but despite coming from this place of just immediate support and understanding as a parent, there were still a number of things that I went through that were not fun. And when you're in it and you're so focused on your child's wellness, parents and caregivers can end up neglecting themselves. And so I think it's important for mental health professionals to understand that if they, if they come to them needing help with their child, that it's okay to ask them if they need help too. Uh, and that's one thing that I will say about the Yale Gender Program is that it is the most holistic program I have seen in terms of the entire family and their wellness and the supports that they need. Um, so I went through a process of mourning the birth name. Uh, my, my spouse and I chose that name for specific reasons. And there were times that it felt like a rejection. 
but then on the other side of it, and with supports and with help from people, you know, like our, our other panelists today, it's like that's you just realize that it's not a rejection at all. It's a it's a it's a journey for your child. And this is it's critical that when you're going through these things that you do not burden your child with them. You're an adult, you have to deal with them on your own because your child is already going through enough. Um, that is critical. And I think that's a message that every parent and caregiver should get. Um, in terms of gendered expectations, I mean, like I said, there were not a lot of them in our house because we, we just naturally had a very gender neutral household. Um, but I would say with having a trans mask child, I, I had a lot of questions about future childbirth options. Um, should my child want that and how could I support them? Um, um, you know, there's obviously an enormous amount of fear and concern because of the bullying and harassment and the societal attitudes. Um, you, it's constant and it's relentless. It's just all the time. You you have to be thinking about your child's safety in a in a way that most parents, only parents of trans children have to think about it. Um, and then of course there was, as I mentioned, the loss of any ambition or aspirations for his future. He felt like he had no future in, in the same way that, that Tony described earlier. And that is an incredibly <clears throat> painful to see that happen as a parent. Um, you know, dealing with the bullying and harassment. Um, the bullying and harassment is, is, is the primary cause of all of the things my child experienced, like the suicidal ideations and the cutting and the depression and the anxiety. And um, there were times that things happened that I had, when I was dealing with them, I was in physical pain myself. It actually, it was so profoundly ugly that I, I was in physical pain. And because the school was not cooperative, it was just, it was horrible. It, it, and I'm not a person who who feels, gets that physical pain. Like I, I know that it's a side effect of, of mental health challenges like depression and anxiety. So this was really the first time that I experienced, I experienced something like that. And so again, as a parent, this is a this is a way that a mental health professional can support parents and caregivers is is really to understand for people like me who has been fortunate to not have any mental health challenges over the course of my lifetime that suddenly something like this is feeling very very new to me and and very strange and I needed help understanding it. Societal attitudes are, are a huge problem, especially when you have older children on, on a gender journey like this, because they do consume media, as Dr. O pointed out. Um, it contributes to that feeling of having no future. I would say from our my seat, that's what I've taken away from our experience. It, it really, it really, you know, when you when your child can't go to 28 states in this country, it, it again, affects, affects their feelings of security and what future they have. And that is the, that is the state, of, that is the situation in this country right now. There are 28 states I am not comfortable taking my child to. Um, Decision-making about gender-affirming care is another, process. There's a huge misconception um, in a lot of the rhetoric that you'll hear that like that it, they make it sound like people are handing out hormone treatments on street corners. And that is not what it's like at all. Uh, it is that any, any bona fide gender affirming care program like Yale, you go through a process that involves a team of physicians um, and you gather all sorts of information and 
then the parents and caregivers can go back and make a decision from there. And if that's as a parent, that's another, that's yet another part of what messes with your head. Because <clears throat> when I was going through this process, the societal attitudes actually found their way into my head a couple of times. And when they did, I was really questioning what was going on with me because I did not feel that way at all. And one of the messages that, that was a, the, an intrusive thought I had at one point was, um, this will mut be mutilating my kid, which is one of the things you hear in the ugly rhetoric, right? And I immediately was ashamed to have thought that because that's not how I feel at all. And that was a good two or three week process where I had the good fortune of actually having access to people like Tony, where I could confide in them that this happened to me and have them tell me it's okay. It's okay. Because the reality was is not providing access to gender affirming care was mutilating my child. It was the complete opposite. But that is how, that is that, that is the impact of societal attitudes, not just on the transgender child, but on the parents and caregivers as well. Um, we also had a little bit of disagreement between some mental health professionals about access to gender affirming care. Um, and uh, that, that made it, the decision making process take a little bit longer while we resolved that. Um, and again, that was that it just made things harder at a time when they shouldn't have been harder. So, um, and then the last thing is that's incredibly stressful is, um, how we, we have to think differently as parents now. So I'll give one quick example and move on in, in the interest of time, but, um, you know, my, my child, uh, we, every year we, we send, um, we send them away for two to three weeks to be with friends and camp and things like that. And in purchasing a plane ticket, one of the one of the more affordable options had a four hour layover in North Carolina. And my spouse and I had to have a very serious conversation about whether or not we wanted our child to be in North Carolina for just four hours in an airport. Other parents never even have to consider that ever. Um, so while we're dealing with all of this, um, I am a person who, uh, when I see an injustice, I, I react with rage and hostility. And then that, that flame calms down a little and I, I'm able to redirect that, those feelings, um, towards something po uh, positive. Now, I think that this particular reaction had a lot to do with the fact that it was happening to my own child, which was another learning moment for me as a parent, because I, I had never had a strong maternal instinct to begin with. Um, that, that doesn't mean I wasn't parenting my child. I just never had strong instincts to have kids. So the way that I reacted to this was even really very surprising to me. Um, so you know, I could let this situation, so uh, people react differently to these situations. I, I chose to, the way I describe it to try to get people to understand it is I took, I took that rage and I shaped it into a ball and I threw it back at the people who were, who were the arbiters of the injustice, injustices. And, but, you know, I have a friend that when something bad happens, they go into a downward spiral that it takes them three or four days to climb out of. So mental health professionals, I mean, should, should understand, I mean, I'm sure you do understand how people react to things in life very differently. Um, so um, as I did the research um, on this issue, it really became clear to me how the law does not protect children who are not out yet. Um, and so that is one of the things that became a priority because these kids are suffering in silence and they're hurting themselves. And it's literally, it is not hyperbolic to say it's kidding them or killing them. Um, so with that, I've mentioned the gap in services before. 
Um, so the next step was, is addressing this issue on a statewide level. Because while Connecticut has strong non-discrimination policies and safe school climate statutes in, in place, um, there's also Connecticut very much values local control at the district level. So, and no one is holding these schools accountable for um, executing these policies consistently. And I realized that we needed to go to the state level to start dealing with it there. But then as a cis hetero person, the question became for me, uh, if I'm going to shape this idea and actually do something with it, it I must have the input of, of the queer community. Like, like leadership needs to feel, leadership across the state needs to feel as if the project is theirs as much it is, as it is mine. So I cannot underscore the value of collaboration um, and, and the, the respect and understanding it brought to me as the founder of, of the project. Um, the other thing when working with the queer community, I'm sure a number of you know um, uh, that Building trust is important, as I mentioned, actively listening. Um, and there were times that I made mistakes uh, with, the, with the leadership that was helping me shape the project. And the key was, um, was to own those mistakes and just demonstrate actively in the wake of that, that I had learned. I had learned from what had happened. Um, uh, be, you know, being visible and being an upstander are key. Um, the, I can't underscore the importance of, again, actively demonstrating to the community that you understand how it feels for them every day to have to validate their humanity to people and to take on that burden for them. Um, and then the last thing was, you know, seeking leadership from the community that you aim to serve. So, um, with that, what I did was I had two different groups. At the onset, I had a group of, of LGBTQ plus leadership organization and leadership across the state helping me shape the project. We met for a good nine, eight months. And when the idea for the project really formed. And then <clears throat> once the idea for the project formed, we, uh, I put together an advisory council uh, made up of parents and and caregivers, allies, and educators, which I'll get to in a moment. But this work with the community and understanding what was needed, the project has three goals. And the first was creating a statewide network of folks so that we have each other. Now, this is different from the, the parent support groups that, that Yale Gender Program does or that Tony does. This is a this is a group that is poised and ready to take action when needed. So, um, a great example is this past legislative session. I had the pleasure of working on a hate speech task force bill, and that bill passed with unanimous support. But then, in the wake of that, um, someone needed to be nominated to take the LGBTQ plus seat on that task force that was going to be nominated by by a senator in the state. And so I just reached out to this network and I said, time for action. Everybody write to Senator Duff and let's recommend Mallory Sanchez for the seat on this HP task force. And we just got the news yesterday that Mallory it was officially appointed to that task force. So it's really, it's really a network that's, that's for action. Um, the second thing is parents and caregivers need to know what their options are when they are dealing with this issue. They need one place they can go. And that is everything from filing complaints and things like that to just, just working with your school district. And the third thing we do is policy, uh, legislative work. Um, so that's that. This is our Parent Advisory Council, the only thing I'm gonna point out here is that I specifically pointed out someone as a step-parent because um, a supportive, so the step-parents need to be considered too and the support of an amazing step-parent is life-saving is life saving as well. And with that, thank you um, for all of your work. This is my youngest.
um, who Tony and Dr. Olazewski have been an incredible part of his life. So thank you. I think that that is my cue to close us out and just to offer a few closing remarks. Um, and I just want to make um, one observation, and it maybe leads to a question for our panelists. Um, I mean, first of all, just deepest appreciation. Um, there's lots of comments in the chat. It's just such a really powerful blend of perspectives and experiences, and it's just been such an important conversation. So thank you to all of our presenters. Um, if there is a theme that stands out to me across what each of you shared, right, Tony, I think you used the phrase like, you're not crazy if you're trans, but being trans can make you crazy. And Christy, you talked about socialization agents. And Melissa, you talked about just the traumatic destructive impact of kind of bullying and harassment and not just from peers, but also adults. And that theme there to me sort of suggests like the problem is not inside the youth or the child, right? So the solution in and of itself can't be there. So even if a youth has access to gender affirming care or a gender affirming mental health therapist, it sounds like what I hear you saying, it's not enough to intervene just in that space because really the problem is in the reactions to the person and not allowing people to be authentically kind of who they are. So I'm just wondering if any of you have any sort of closing suggestions about if you're a mental health professional who wants to show up in this space and do the right thing and make things better, what would you recommend if one-on-one -on -one or youth-based therapy is just, it's not enough? So I'm just curious if anybody has any thoughts on that. I, I guess I can just, this is Tony, I guess I can just chime in for a second. You know, I often ask a cisgender person how they know their gender identity. I often ask an adult, and they always say to me, what are you talking about? I was like, how do you know you're male or female? And they're like, well, um, I, um, and they really struggle with telling me how they know that. And I point to them, then why do we expect children to, to explain how they know who they are? I think a lot of times we look at trans and non-binary kids and we ask them that question. How do you know that you're male or female or, or both or neither? And we expect them to give an answer. If they don't give an answer, then we invest, then, then, then they're not, they're not trans, that there's something wrong. I think it's super important to realize that no one really has words to describe their gender identity. We can't put that burden on children to describe, to tell us how they know. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. And I'll, I'll also add, um, you know, I think that with mental health, you know, Janice, you make a really important point that we need to have providers out there to provide the care. Um, but we don't need just well-intentioned people. We need well-trained people. And so I think that it's really important um, for folks to be able, if they want this to be, a, you know, an area of folks that they treat, you know, we want it to be so that people can treat a spectrum of individuals. And also, you know, sometimes well-intentioned people say things or do things that aren't necessarily helpful also. So we have to, you know, take extra steps to get extra assistance in understanding the gender minority stress model or how to help folks to understand this plus piece and to understand that this is the external pressure that we, you know, that is really hurting folks. In addition to that, you know, I think that the medical piece is really important. And so we know that medical interventions do separately impact mental health, which is really important. Third, I think, you know, the third piece to this that I, that I was thinking about is that we can't put the pressure on the kids to change these systems of care, right? We as adults also have to be able to intervene and to say, we know that this is wrong. And so how do we intervene? How do we do this at our, you know, school level? How do we do this? You know, Melissa, you, you are a force and you did this amazing thing. And so like, you know, making sure that we can do, you know, we can do more for our kids and we're not expecting them to make the changes, right? That we're going to be the adults in the situation to talk to the other adults that aren't behaving well and to be able to try to change systems of care. Um, and this is, you know, multifaceted, right? If we're thinking about different, you know, areas that we also have to make changes in. But I think that, you know, by by making these small pieces, and I'm not saying you don't have to create an organization tomorrow, but making small movements into making these more systematic changes and making sure that we're also voting and, you know, being out there and, and talking about the issues that we need to, to make sure that we're supporting 
all of that can come together in making sure that we can help folks move way, moving forward. That's really, that's really helpful. It's, I mean, I hear each of you really kind of saying, it's like, you got to be a change agent beyond just your individual support of an individual youth, but it's not enough to just be a well-intentioned change agent. You have to be a well-informed change agent. And I will just speak for myself personally that I learned a lot today just in the last 90 minutes. Um, I'm really excited to dive in to some of these additional resources that we've put um, together for today. So just by way of a practical comment, there's a question in the chat about um, where do we access the slides? So usually within a week, two weeks max, both the recording and the slides that will have all the embedded links um, are posted on our New England MHTTC website. And Ingrid has graciously just put that link into the chat box for us. Any, I want to, we have only about three minutes left. What I'm going to do is I am just going to put our link to our survey up on the screen. We really do value your feedback. Um, I don't see any additional questions that had come into the chat. Please do check out the chat. Got some great stuff in there. Um, I asked Tony to drop in the link to some of his publications page and his uh, memoir. So, you know, please do take a look at the chat there. And again, just lots of thanks for what people were able to, to learn today, even the practical suggestions around, thanks for correcting me, right? And then just move on, like not even thinking necessarily about how the I'm sorry, I'm sorry could land with the misgendered person. It's just a different way of thinking about it. Even your intent is not the same as the impact. Um, and so there's a lot of expression of appreciation for the suggestions. And I'll just add see, in closing, yeah. if it's okay, yes, as mental can. health as mental health professionals, what I would suggest is working from a place if you're if you're working with parents and caregivers and even transgender children themselves, work from a place of believing them when they tell you who they are. Um, that's that's the only place to start from. And understand that parents and caregivers, can be burdened by all sorts of, of things like dogma, political ideology. And the reality is when your child says these things, believe them when they tell you who they are. That's a very powerful concluding statement that really brings us full circle to, I think, one of the very first comments that you shared in your introduction, Tony. Um, I just want to say by way of closing, please see also that Melissa has put into the chat the website of the Out Accountability um, Project. And I will just say that the way that this webinar came to be today is that I actually, as a parent, a part of a parent listserv, I got an email from Melissa about some of the really powerful work being done to unite parents for change and to unite stakeholders for change and the good work of the Out Accountability Project. And that then snowballed into us pulling in Tony and Christy, and it just came together in such a powerful way. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all you do um, for our youth um, and for people in general. And thanks to everyone for being here today. Please check out our website link and to slides and the recording will be up within a, a few weeks. And as, I think as you saw, um, the slides are really packed with wonderful resources, and we do hope that you'll check them out. So thanks, everyone. Big thanks to Tony, Christy, and Melissa, and we'll go ahead and sign off now. Have a great weekend.